Hi class, welcome to Advantage. My name is Dr. Scott Adamson, and in this video, we're gonna continue some conversation about uh, the derivative of trigonometric functions that you may have watched in the previous video. In the previous video, we looked at the derivative of the sine of x function, and this time we're gonna study the derivative of cosine of x. So if you've been in a calculus class, you might know this and maybe memorize it. Maybe you don't really know where it comes from. We should have an opportunity to think through where does this come from? The derivative of cosine of x does indeed work out to be negative sine of x, but why? Let's begin by exploring it graphically using Desmos. We'll explore the derivative of the cosine function by examining its graph. And when we examine its graph, what we're looking at is for any input quantity x, the output quantity is going to be the rate at which this function is changing, the derivative of this graph. So for example, look right here at x equals 0. At x equals 0, this graph it has a, a, a plateau, and so we would say that at least nearby to 0, this function is not changing. Its derivative is 0. And so as I examine the derivative graph, which will appear here in blue, notice in blue, Desmos is going to be graphing the derivative as its definition, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And remember, in that definition, h has to be nearby to 0. And so I've got a slider for h that I can make it as close to 0 as I desire. So as, as h is close to 0, as x increases, we're going to see in blue a graph of this derivative function, and we think it should start out near 0, and certainly it does. Now let's go little by little. As x increases, say to here, the rate at which this function is changing is, well, it's not changing dramatically, but if we increase x by a little bit, the output quantity drops a little bit, therefore a negative rate of change. And certainly we see here in blue a graph that's showing us the, that negative rate. Notice when x inputs a 0.15, the rate of change is about negative 0.149. And that rate of change continues to be negative, that is if we increase the x variable, the y, the function value decreases by more and more and more and more. In fact, right about in here, I would say, if we input x, the output of this function, the y value of this function, decreases by its greatest amount. So my blue derivative function should show me a most negative result right about there. And certainly we see it. In fact, there it is. It's showing a negative 1 rate of change. Now continue from there. As x continues to increase, the rate of change is still negative. That is, if x increases, the function outputs are still getting smaller, more negative, but they're getting smaller at less and less and less of a rate. And so in blue, we're going to see this blue function start to increase, still on the negative side of its vertical axis, but it's going to become less negative, less negative, less negative. And in fact, right here at the bottom, at the valley of this function, we once again have a rate of change of zero. That is, right at this, um, at this valley, if I increase x by a little bit, the function just doesn't change much. And so we would expect a rate of change of zero right there. Then after that, we once again see some positive rates. If we increase x, the output function increases just a little bit. If we increase x, the output function increases a little bit more. If we increase x, the input function, uh, the output of the function increases even a little bit more. And so in here, we're going to see a derivative, a rate of change that continually gets more and more and more positive until I think we could argue that right in here, if we input um, an x and change it a little bit, the output is going to be the greatest amount of change that we would see. And so we're going to see that blue function peak out right about in here. And in fact, we can click here and see that right in there, the rate of change is one unit of change. That positive rate of change stays positive, but as we start to turn towards that next peak, that next maximum, if we increase x, 
the output increases, but not by as much. If we increase x, the output increases by but not by as much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until once again at that peak, we're going to see a derivative of 0. And so my blue derivative function, while still on the positive side of the scale, will be less positive and less positive and less positive until we get back to 0. And this kind of observation will continue in the same pattern. We see this periodic or cyclical function, and so the derivative will behave in a periodic or cyclical way as well. And so we'll see that pattern continue with the negative rates of change to a zero rate of change to positive rates of change, and that would just continue indefinitely. So now, look at this blue function. Now you might think of it as kind of resembling a sine curve. Let me show you what the sine wave looks like. Notice the sine wave increases initially. Our derivative is decreasing initially, so it's not exactly a sine curve, but it's a direct reflection across the x-axis of that sine wave. That is, it is a negative sine of x curve. So yes, it appears graphically that the derivative function for cosine of x appears to be negative sine of x. And just to highlight that h going to 0 business, notice if h is further away from 0 than what I had it, the graph does not align as it should. But as h approaches 0, that blue derivative graph merges onto our conjectured, at least, y equals negative sine of x. So what we'll do is we'll now approach it from a more formal, symbolic approach, and we'll confirm what we expect to happen, that the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So from your work with Desmos, you saw that certainly the derivative of cosine of x graphically looks like it should come out to be negative sine of x as we expect. But let's now look at it from a more formal perspective. Let's go back to the limit definition of derivative and find out if this really is true. The limit definition of derivative is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Let's apply this definition in this case and see what happens. So the derivative of f of x, if f of x is cosine of x, run it through the definition of derivative, would look like this. f of x plus h. If we input x plus h into this function for x, we will get cosine of x plus h. Then we subtract f at x. If we input x, we get cosine of x. We get the function itself. That is f of x, so we'll just subtract cosine of x. And then we, of course, divide all that by h. Now, at this moment, you might be thinking, well, why don't we just go right now and figure out what it's going to be? If h is really close to 0, well, x plus really close to 0 is really close to x. So we have cosine of x minus cosine of x, 0 all over really close to zero, mm, just not really helpful. We have to do some work. We have to do some algebraic manipulations to get this thing to a place where we can apply the limit and see where this is going to go. And what we need first is a little information about how cosine of a sum works. This is the cosine of an angle measure, x, an input quantity, x, that's been changed by that little tiny bit. So we have to stop for a moment and consider a fact about the cosine of x plus h. I'm going to start with fun fact number one. Fun fact number one is if you have the cosine of the sum of two angles, we can expand that by saying take the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle, and then subtract from that the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. Now that fun fact is something that was typically taught in a trigonometry or pre-calculus class, for now, for the sake of this video, trust me, this is a true fun fact. Now, let's apply that fun fact back at our justification and see how it's going to help us. So we'll apply that fun fact right here. The cosine of a sum is equivalent to the cosine of that first angle measure times the cosine of that second angle measure minus the sine of that first angle measure times the sine of that second angle measure. So this is all equivalent to the cosine of that sum. We still need to subtract the cosine of x, 
and we still need to divide all that by h. Now I know right now it's getting a lot messier, but trust me, it's gonna get a lot better here in just a moment. Let's continue to manipulate algebraically and see if we can come to a place where we can apply that limit and figure out what this derivative function is going to be. I'd like you to notice that this first term has a factor of cosine of x, and the last term has a factor of cosine of x. So just for the sake of convenience, let's arrange, rearrange the numerators so that those two terms containing the cosine of x are nearby one another. Because what that allows us to do is they have a common factor of cosine of x. So let's factor out the cosine of x. Now when we factor out the cosine of x from this first term, we'll still have the factor of cosine of h. When we factor out the cosine of x from the cosine of x, we're left with a factor of one. And then we still have this sine of x times sine of h term. Now just again for convenience, to help visualize the algebra here, we're gonna make one more move. We're gonna make a distributive property move. We have a numerator divided by a single term h. So we can distribute over division and get this result. We'll have the cosine of x times the cosine of h minus one, all of that of divided by h, minus the other term, the sine of x times sine of h all divided by h. Now we're gonna take the limit as h approaches zero for all of this, but when we write it this way, some more just convenient visualization of the algebraic maneuvers will help you to see what we're gonna do. First, it's h that's approaching zero. As h approaches zero, the emphasis then is on this factor that involves h going to zero. So what we can do, it's a equivalent to say this, the cosine of x, times the limit. And then likewise over here, as h approaches zero, sine of h over h is what's gonna be impacted by that h approaching zero, not the sine of x. So we can equivalently say the sine of x times the limit. Now these two limits might look familiar. Let's go look at some more fun facts. In a previous video, uh, Understanding Limits Parts 5 and 6, we have a, an explanation for these two limits. So we won't go through all the details again, but fun fact number two, as h approaches zero, cosine h minus one all divided by h also approaches zero. And as h approaches zero, sine of h over h actually approaches one. So go watch those videos if you need to, to have some understanding about why this is true. But we're now gonna take these two fun facts and apply them back at our justification work. So using what I call fun fact number two, we have the cosine of x times that limit, which turned out to be zero. We have minus the sine of x times this limit, which turned out to be one. And so cosine of x times zero, minus sine of x times one, certainly leaves us with minus the sine of x. And so as we saw with the graphs, as we're expecting, the derivative of cosine of x is indeed negative sine of x. So we have evidence graphically, we have evidence more formally with a more symbolic justification that this is indeed a true fact.